Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining. At CIQ, we're focused on powering the next generation of software infrastructure, leveraging the capabilities of cloud, hyperscale, and HPC. From research to the enterprise, our customers rely on us for the ultimate Rocky Linux, Werewolf, and Aptainer support escalation. We provide deep development capabilities and solutions, all delivered in the collaborative spirit of open source. Hello. Welcome, everyone. What's going on, Zane? Good afternoon, Rose. How are you? Um, magical. Magical? Yes. Why magical? That's my word for today. Because why should it be anything else? Magical is usually your Monday word. <laughs> Mondays are pretty good, too. Thursday. Here, I'll even do like um, an interpretive dance for you. Oh, interesting. Is that the Thursday Magical. dance? There you go. <laughs> Great. <laughs> what are we talking about today? You know what? One of my, like, I, I didn't even know this was going to be such a fun topic. I know that we've been talking about automation for a really long time and like wanting it to happen, right? And our customers have been talking about it. They've been asking for it. Um, and we've been talking about it behind the scenes for a really long time. And we finally released it. We finally released a sender automation. And so I had no idea how many different ways in which you can automate things. So today specifically, we're talking about a sender, which is automation for networking. Awesome. Uh, this seems to come <laughs> up quite often. So I'm really interested to hear what we have to say about this. I know. Bring Good everyone in. Some, like, crazy experts on the team. Yep. That guy there and that one. And that there we one. go. So cool. So I'm going right. to, I'm going to make you guys introduce yourself. I yes. know you've been on before. It's not the first time, but I'm going to start in the bottom over here and say, Jimmy, you're on you're mute. Jimmy, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. It was the first time on the webinar for me. So I got this new interface to deal with. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so I am Jimmy. Welcome for the first time. I am a I am a, a, yeah, what am I here? Uh, I'm basically, I, I work with Ansible here on this <laughs> project. Uh, basically, I'm a principal solution engineer. I work on Ansible. I work on Ascender. I'm working with pushing back up to the upstream, working with our clients on different parts of Ascender, how they utilize it, pretty much just anything and everything. Very nice. Mr. Ford, welcome back. Hey, good afternoon. I had to look at the time again. So, uh, Good afternoon, Michael Ford, based out of Chicago, part of the sales team here at CIQ, and also uh, helping Jimmy a little bit with uh, uh, a center and uh, development as well. Fantastic. Greg, I think most people have seen your stuff now, but <laughs> introduce yourself again. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I'm Greg Soul. I'm a principal specialist engineer uh, here at CIQ as well. And uh, I do all the things and I make the videos and uh, the blog posts and uh, I basically ride uh, Jimmy and Ford's coattails kind of one after the other. So it's fantastic. It's a good role. Huh. It's the best. So networking comes up a lot when it comes to a sender. I know there are talk to people over the last couple of weeks that have tens of devices, hundreds of devices, thousands of devices. Actually, in the last couple of weeks, we've been talking to people that have hundreds of thousands of network devices. It's always the same question. What can I do with it? So that's a really generic question. I'm going to let you guys answer that. What can you do with it? Feel free. <laughs> what do you want to do? Feel free. Go Otherwise, first, Greg, I, wanna... As you say, I won't stop talking. So somebody else talk first. I'll talk first briefly and then I'll let Greg go have at it. So, I mean, honestly, I think the better question is what can't you do? Because I think that list is a lot shorter. Um, I might have talked about this before, but, you know, a lot of things with, you know, that you want to do in the beginning, if someone's new in their automation journey, uh, what are the things that you can do that won't require making any changes? So anything from just gathering information, which Ansible refers to as facts, using that information to build reports, whether it's PDF format, email, um, web. So I use S3 Bucks a lot for that kind of stuff. So information gathering, anything from one-off configurations, if you want to get to that by yourself in your own little sandbox lab, to large-scale configurations at an enterprise level, that's something where a center automation will be a lot better because you can have more guided guardrail automation at scale. 
And I think that's my short answer before Greg goes into more detail. It's, it's tough because it's so comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, Michael always says it so eloquently. Um, I'll be dirty about it and just say, what are the, some of the things, like as a network engineer coming in, like I've never done any automation. You know, what what can I expect? Obviously, there's low-hanging fruit. Like Michael said, you can go and collect information, which is great. Uh, you know, you're developing reports. You're looking for compliance stuff, right? So I've got to make sure that this thing is configured on all of my equipment, right? I've got these specific settings, whether it's security or DNS or whatever it happens to be. It's great for just running reports and keeping those people off your backs, right? Like the compliance people. Um, it's also great for discrete changes, right? So crawl, walk, run. A lot of people crawl, right? They start pulling information. Walk, you're going to start generally doing discrete changes, right? So I will change all the DNS servers for North America, right? And then, oh my gosh, that worked. That was amazing, you know? And then I'll just start kind of layering on additional things, right? And then really, I think... You almost say the holy grail, but not necessarily the holy grail is uh, doing firmware updates, right? I'm an organization. I've got 10,000 switches and I've got to do firmware updates. There's a CVE that just came out. I mean, how many human hours does that consume, right? Yeah, on average, 15 minutes per device. It's going to take a human to not only push all those configuration changes, but verify everything after it's working. And then I guarantee by the time they hit the 30th they're not checking very hard whether everything is working really well it's just you just don't have time for that right and so when you can start using automation for that and using it in an intelligent fashion so uh we talk about crawl walk run you can do that in your automations as well so one of the things i like to do is the batching aspects of pushing against hosts so say i've got 100 hosts i want to operate against i can run it in a batch fashion so i'll say run it against one host make sure it goes all the way through okay that worked now run it against 10 more hosts Make sure that goes through. All right, now run it against 50% of the remaining inventory. Once that works successfully, run it against 100%, right? So I can kind of step through slowly and make sure that everything's working. And when I say working, part of my automations are not just update the firmware, but after that, do this giant battery of tests, right? Can I get to it? Can I get through it? All that stuff. And so you can really verify that your equipment's working and you can do it in a vice uh, easy fashion. So uh, I can I can fully admit that I am not perfect. My configurations uh, sometimes have mistakes. And it's nice when the automation will catch those mistakes before I ruin an entire production environment. Um, when I say that, uh, you know, the, the old saying is, especially in networking, everybody's got a, a test network. Not everybody's also got a production network. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, generally, it's really awesome to do that stuff. So to me, that's kind of, the the crawl walk run method now when i say holy grail oftentimes in networking people are referring to configuration as code that's where i basically store my configuration somewhere for what this switch this router this firewall whatever is to be it's supposed to look like this and then i just run the automation and it will make it so right it will connect to that device and make any changes as, as required right based on my configuration that i've got stored here the cool thing is uh, Ansible has this concept of item potency, which means I will make a change if I need to. If I don't, I won't. And guess what? I can rerun that piece of automation over and over and it doesn't break stuff. Unlike every script I've ever written in the past by hand, uh, Ansible can really take that stuff into account. Um, and I have seen item potency being baked into devices that don't natively have it. So uh, oh, let me point that direction down there, Jimmy. Uh, he actually uh, baked in most of the item potents into some of our lab stuff using some Microtech equipment, which was awesome. I'd be, I think it would be really cool if he would kind of step through the process that we used to follow when we were like doing changes and maybe a little bit about how you kind of baked some of that in there. Oh, yeah, sure. So, and in, in stepping back to the original question, you know, what can you do with a sender for networking? You know, a sender itself is more of a framework. We don't try to hem haul you into, oh, you can only do automation this way. You can only do this little thing here. It's a framework. It allows you to build the automation the way you want to do it. Something that works with your processes, that works with your internal guidelines, with your security considerations and all that. It's just basically a framework that allows you to build the automation for yourself. You know, so talking about how we did our lab before, you know, we had a lab, we actually still have another, a, a large lab that me and Greg share with a couple of other people. And within there, you know, I don't want to be managing the firewall for all these different people. And every time let, Greg spins <laughs> up a new test machine and wants, you know, to pop a hole in the firewall to get access to that, 
I don't want to have to, even though he technically does have access to the firewall, but and he can do it himself, but he always comes to me for everything for some reason. But I don't want to have to sit there and do this for him all the time. So instead, what I did was use, you know, standard infrastructure as code practices to where I have a Git repository inside that Git repository or different variable files. Inside that, I have my entire firewall configuration. So, you know, if I need a port open to the external from here to there, if I need it natted over to this uh, port over here, you know, all that can be done in the configuration itself. And that entire Git repository points back to a sender. So every time you make a change within that firewall config file, uh, it point, and it's just a simple YAML file. So it's te plain text based. There's no programming or anything else in there. As soon as you make a change to that, it Git kicks off, uh, calls over to a sender, says, "Hey, somebody made a change." It goes through the process of looking at all the firewall rules. You know, it gets, again, because Microtech routers don't have any idle problems built in. You know, you're going to be running direct commands on everything. Uh, there's not a lot of stuff built in for that. So instead, it looks through every single firewall rule, make sure it matches to what we have in our configuration. If it doesn't match, it changes its match. If it's someone removed the config or a, a role, it removes it, you know, and such forth. But going through the lab and actually building that out and doing that for not only just firewall rules, for DNS, for uh, DHCP, for literally everything else we use within there, just making it easy to where in one place we can manage it, but we also have that backup of now all this stuff is in Git. So if that, you know, our firewall itself dies, all you got to do is rerun that playbook on it and it's going to reset everything up exactly how we want it. Yeah. And and you you kind of hinted at it too. That becomes part of the change control procedure, yep. right? One person yep, exactly. does a PR and then somebody else has to look at it and verify it, right? Yep. I go in, I look at it, say, yo, why is he doing this? Oh, no, I'm not going to allow that. Deny the actual <laughs> PR. <laughs> And then go have a talk with Greg about proper etiquette. <laughs> I think it's less talks with Greg. It's more about talking to me. What are you <laughs> doing in here? Why are you trying to do so? that's usually what it is. Yeah. But yeah, no, it, but it it really does make it part of kind of like a, a cohesive like flow, part of your ecosystem. I think it's it's really cool how it can kind of bake in your change control as well as kind of like you know your configs are in here. You can see who changed what and you know the rationale behind their changes. Like yeah, it's all it, kind of right there. And even all the history and everything else with it. And it also empowers everybody else. So like Michael, you know, Michael isn't in there. Say he doesn't know anything about networking at all. You know, I can allow him to go in there and actually modify firewall rules for his devices and add them in very easily by just modifying a text file. He doesn't have to touch the firewall. I don't have to give him access to the firewall rule. The automation does the process for it. So you're doing I mean, it a little more sophisticated, Jimmy. Sorry, Michael. I'll let you yeah, go ahead because I have a your... question on this. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I'm not a microtech person. And and I think that we've done this in real life where I have no clue what's going on in microtech. And you've done exactly that where you just present, here is the variable font that I need to change to add what I want for those firewall rules or whatever I need to change. And that's exactly how it works. I don't have to be you know, knowledgeable about any particular network platform at all. I can just be presented with whatever you want and then we can make the changes and you can trust that it's going to work properly. So Jimmy, stepping away from the infrastructure as code piece, could is there a way you could actually just create a web form so somebody could come in? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, need to, I, mean, well, I wouldn't would that do go? that just because then there's no checks and balances behind it. I mean, Still, but something but less important like just DNS entries internally, sure. You need to do a DNS entry, just fill out this form, boom, it's, it's doing the same thing. I could have it even just add it to that particular file if I wanted to and then have the regular process go. Or, you know, it can direct access and run this thing. A uh, sender itself is going to log every change that's made. It's going to have the details of who ran it, what ran, what they've inputted. So you still get all that. Yeah, and to that point, you could also integrate with, say, like ServiceNow. So in yeah. Jimmy's example of a DNS entry, you could have a form in ServiceNow where... You fill out all the details, you submit it, it goes into the ServiceNow approval system. Somebody will say, yeah, that looks good. It calls a sender and takes care of everything. Yeah. Or you extract it even further and say, okay, we, we just build it into our entire process. You know, we don't have someone go in and request a firewall rule. Instead, they go in and they request a web server. When they request a web server, it kicks off the playbook to add the firewall rule. You know, you tie yep. it to the actual service they need. That's so a cool Greg, part of that. Up... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Greg. No, I was going to change subjects a little bit, so go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say the cool part of that is if you make the automation that will allow you to manually do it, somebody go in there, you can also tie that into a workflow and use it in all kinds of different places, right? It becomes really flexible. So, Jimmy, I know you and I were with a customer that had a massive 
environment at one point, uh, and they had one guy, and his yeah. whole job was to patch stuff all day. Mm -hmm. Not going to say what the vendor was, not going to say who it was, but something like this, and kind of to what Greg alluded to earlier, being able to actually have that firmware there to you can pull it out, patch whatever you need to do. Instead of that guy having to spend 13 hours a day, seven days a week, just patching the same thing over and over, could he have automated that? Oh, yeah. And, How you much? know, and automation is made for things exactly like that. Uh, you know, another client I had where literally the they had one guy in there who, I mean, it was a, a Windows client. They had one guy in there and he had, you know, 8,000 different random Windows PowerShell scripts he wrote to do everything. That guy literally got hit by a bus. He didn't he didn't die. He was in the hospital for a bit, but he literally got hit by a bus. So that's why I use that example all the time. And they brought us in and said, hey, you know, <laughs> we need to do something about this because we don't want this to happen again. So we went through the process of helping them actually take those, you know, even all the existing work he's already done and integrate it into the automation so that he doesn't have to be there to push the button to run the script. Anybody can do it. Wouldn't so, it have been simpler just to teach that guy how to walk across the street and look both ways? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I imagine he got wow. some alert and had to look at his phone at the time. Ah, uh, that's sort of what. Yeah. Yeah. When you're that the important. Broke. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Funny. So, Michael. So, go ahead, Dave. You're going to ask a question. There, there are a lot of different things that take place in a network environment. Like, there are a lot of different pieces. And as things change and as customers grow and prices change and everything, right? They start doing network migrations. So switching vendors. Is a sender something that could help if you're going through a whole scale switch of a vendor? Could you use something like a sender to help streamline that process and make that migration easier? I would say absolutely. And there's, so I'll say this, there's different ways to tackle that problem. So I don't know if Greg or Jimmy has thoughts on what to do. But honestly, I go back to capturing information, fact gathering, things of that nature. If you understand it, networking is networking, right? So we're all dealing with routings the same, um, IP addresses are the same, all that stuff's not going anywhere. So if you understand the principles of what's happening on your particular device, you can always pull that information. There are Ansible modules for uh, just about every different platform you can think of. The ones that I think of obviously are things like Juniper and Cisco and uh, apparently Microtik, which I know is big. I'm just not, you know, super familiar with that in my, in my own personal experience, but that's a great example of capturing information, putting it in a data file. And I'm just saying data file as a, as a kind of general, uh, general terminology, but as long as you have the data, you can use whatever appropriate models to pull information from your old environment, push it out elsewhere. Uh, as long as you have the idea of, you know, what it's going to, perhaps what model number is going to, you know, what operating system version you're dealing with, all that kind of stuff. So absolutely, that's something that we can do. If you have the playbooks for it, right? So that's the thing that we, you might have to write, but a lot of the stuff's already out there. I think we talked about this before, where I really build something from scratch. I usually take something that's out on GitHub, but the short answer is yes, we can do that. Absolutely, that we, that can be done with the sender. Yeah, so I don't know. Nodding, yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, um, I think in practical terms, how would you how would you actually do that? Um, so when you're talking about networking with Ansible, um, most of the vendors have kind of a specific set of modules, right? And modules are kind of like pre written chunks of code that are going to perform some kind of task for you, right? That that that's one of the beauty parts of using Ansible, right? Is that it kind of makes it simple, so you don't have to know how to program in Python or any of this stuff. You just got to know the right module to call, and then fill in the blanks from there. But you have like command config. So command is going to be, I'm issuing like a show command. Config is like, I'm throwing raw CLI commands at it. Um, facts to gather facts specifically from network modules. But we also have resource modules. And resource modules have gotten really intelligent. I love the direction we're going with them these days in that you can take a resource module, say for like VLANs, right? There's ones generally specifically for configuring VLANs on a, on a switch or ACLs. ACLs is actually a better example because that gets more complex. So for configuring access lists and what these resource modules can do is you can take kind of a show run version of your config. You can take the resource module and ingest it and it will take it and turn it into a data model for you. So you could store, say, a single access list in a data model, which means you'll have like 
uh, this gigantic list of here's the source IP, here's the destination IP, source port, destination port, whether it's permit or deny. And, you know, so it gets really hairy fast. Whereas if you say that as an ACL line, that's one little line, right? Engineers are used to looking at that stuff this is what we like. You know, it's what we're accustomed to seeing. Um, and so the resource modules will take that ACL in the way you're normally accustomed to seeing it, ingest it as a data model. So I could ingest Cisco ACL, pull it into a data model. Then I could use the Arista resource module, take that same data model that I just stuck in memory and shove it into an Arista device. Right. So it starts making it vendor agnostic. So, I mean, I know that's not the way you want to do it. You want to like store your configs and, you know, Juno's format and then uh, use that to push into an Arista. I, I wouldn't suggest doing that long term, but like in a, a migration sort of scenario, it should be able to do that. And you can even couple that with, say, ZTP, zero touch provisioning. The idea where you take a raw network device, you plug it in the network. It'll look I've even made demos for this where it looks up the MAC address in the CMDB, figures out what device it is, and will take its config that you store in Git repository, excuse me, in a Git repository, and then shove that on the device. So a lot of like really interesting ways. My brain just wants to solve these weird, crazy puzzles. And so it sounds like a really fun challenge to try and do. Go ahead, Jimmy. I was just going to say, my brain's the same way. Just tell me something's impossible, and that's what I'm going to be working on. <laughs> you got to solve Greg's repository problem. Repository. Okay, repository. Repository is a new word. I know. My, my voice stopped working for a moment there. It's <laughs> great. Rose, did you have a question? I think I cut you off earlier. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, totally. I think I got a little like sidetracked with the bus story, Jimmy, and that really, <laughs> that really, I, I will throw you off. It, it did. I got thrown off, and then you know, Greg's like, "Well, let's teach the guy to to walk." I was like, "That real? That's that actually?" I I see the way that your brain works now, right? Like you're going back to what is the actual problem? Like, let's stop putting band aids on things. Um, and like go back, backtrack to what the actual issue is. And so, I mean, I'm curious. I mean, again, it kind of goes back to like when we're talking about a sender, we're talking about automation and all the different things that it can do. I'm curious as to what you guys have found because you've been doing this for a while and you've talked to a lot more companies than I have um, about automation. Like what, what are the blockers for people? Like what would, what would kind of make them hesitate at implementing this kind of uh, what sounds magical uh, resource. I would say the first blocker that I see people run into is just having time. First time, all, time to set it, it all up. Like yeah, to, not mm -hmm. really to set it all up, but to start building the automation because you spend so much time, you know, fighting the fires and everything else in your day-to-day -day job. You know, nowadays we're all understaffed and underpaid and everything else. So finding the time to do all the work that should have been done two weeks ago is difficult. Uh, but what generally I talk to those people and, uh, you know, the way I explain it is find a task, even a small task, something that you just have to do repetitively over and over and over and over again. Something that, you know, it may take you 30 seconds, but you may have to do it, you know, 20 times in a week. Automate that one single task. And now you just freed up that time right there to then automate something else and then continue on to something else to the point to where you have, you know, all the different things within that you have to do, all the fires you have to fight, everything else within your your day automated, which you know brings you back to your real job. Your job isn't really there most of the time to fight the fires. Your job is to go in and think of the big ideas, build the new projects, continue the company forward, versus have to put around put out the little things that pop up. I would say yeah. just some of the other things. I, I apologize, Greg, for interrupting, but no, some no, of the no, other no, things no. that. Yeah, some other thing of that I think might be blockers. I think Jimmy's absolutely right with you know the people that are actually going to be authoring the automation. There's a challenge between doing your day job and also getting this thing off the ground. I think philosophically, especially, I think very rarely do you have a large organization that's going to all flip over at once. Generally, in my experience, you want to talk to one team at a time that's having problems, not problems, but like opportunities to implement Ansible automation and, and try to tackle from there. And then might turn around and be champions to the rest of the organization to uh, start to have more of them adopt. I think the last thing, and I'll be quiet, Greg, if you want to add anything on top of that, is I think security becomes um, a really big issue because now all of a sudden, I, forgive me if I've said this before, but I know I've heard someone call Ansible um, 
uh, just something that could be very destructive if put in the wrong hands. So instead of just letting it go free and manage everything at once, it's, it's really important to have those discussions with InvoSec so they can understand what is it going to touch, what are the guardrails we're going to put in place, what if we have a bad actor inside of the organization, how are we going to prevent them from doing something that could really stop business processes. So I think that's a really big, uh, not, a, not a challenge, just a hurdle to overcome. Hmm. I think uh, like Jimmy and, and Ford spoke to already, there there are challenges. And I think also, depending on what silo you're coming from, those challenges are going to look different. So we're talking about networking today. And for me, one of the biggest challenges I've noticed for networking engineers is they've been CLI cowboys their entire career, right? They just know banging on a keyboard. They probably aren't from like a computer science background necessarily. So like programming or scripting, maybe not kind of like the thing that's like immediately in their wheelhouse, right? So I'm a network engineer. I, I, I come from this world as well. And uh, as I like to say, my caveman brain was capable of learning Ansible. Um, and it does kind of seem overwhelming, right? Like there's this new thing I've got to learn. And is it going to take my job, right? Because that's mm -hmm. sometimes in the back of people's heads. Um, but as Jimmy said, your job is not to sit there and constantly be fighting fires, right? You want to do the things that prevent the fires to begin with, right? You also want to be doing stuff that's fun and interesting. And to me, like always being in a state of panic was never an enjoyable place to be. Um, so learning to do some automation a little at a time, you know, how to eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So you just kind of start slowly, start building up, especially when you um, commit to it as an organization, right? To me, the way you really get it in there is it's kind of a top-down approach, right? When management believes in it and, you know, they can kind of help foster that in the environment, it really can grow. But imagine getting a chunk of your uh, day back, right? Uh, to me, uh, in my early career, the partially the way I measured my self-worth was how I did at work. And all of a sudden, uh, imagine your self-worth being so much better because you're able to automate and do more fun and interesting things. No, no, no I'm not trying to say automation is going to like, you know, uh, make you uh, more Zen like uh, in general, but it can really help you get your hands around stuff. And it's not as scary as it seems. Um, it really will enrich your life and uh, I'm a firm believer if you build yourself, build your resume, you're going to be more valuable to the company, more valuable as an asset, maybe moving anywhere in your career. Yes, sir, Michael. Yeah. And so I want to kind of take this back to the topic at hand too, talking about a center for networking. I think I mentioned in my previous statement, like we have one team at a time we might go in with. And I think networking is a prime opportunity to have that discussion because I, Greg and Jimmy and I have all said this in one way, shape or form. There is so much opportunity to look at something where it's very simple to do a single time on a single switch, but it's a pain in the butt to do at scale. And, you know, that's, that's why networking, I think is very attractive. Uh, excuse me. Automation is very attractive to networking teams because it lets them get rid of all that toil and focus on the things that are business impacting and that really cannot be automated. So I just want to put that out there too. I'm going to ask this question because I know Jimmy has been spending time on it. So have you, Michael, especially around a networking team, a lot of times the networking folks to Greg's point earlier, they're not command line jockeys. They're not Linux people. Installing this stuff is uh, very intimidating for them. I know it's actually kept people from going and automating. Like I don't have time to figure out how to install and run this. I don't really want to rely on the Linux team to own and manage it. What are we doing to make that better? Yeah, so we're building, I guess you could call it more of a universal installer because again, you know, installing it, you know, I used to sell, you know, automation to Windows people is one of my big uh, markets I used to work within. And within there, you know, they're not command line junkies either. They're not Linux guys either. So we try to explain to them, you know, well, this is how you SSH to a machine. And they're like, what is that? So the ability to install this thing is one of the key portions we're working on it and making it universal where it doesn't matter where you're trying to install it. You know, it runs on Kubernetes itself, but we want to be able to run on any Kubernetes anywhere. So we're making an installer where it doesn't matter if you have a blank VM that has nothing on it. Well, it can install uh, K3S for you. Do you have a K8S 
already out there? Do you have uh, Amazon? Do you have Google? Whatever you may have, the ability to install it pretty much anywhere is where we're going. And we're getting pretty close to done with the installer. It's excellent. Yeah, that's one of the things that's always been a topic that comes up is, do I have to pay somebody to install this? It seems like it's really complicated. So it's fantastic. It's a good thing. Well, and, and, and how you, we have the installer you, now, you edit a text file just to put in some information such as where I'm going to install it at, my username, password, that sort of things. And then you just run a setup file. And that's it. Which also makes it so that you don't have to know Kubernetes to go do yep. this. You can just run the script. Yep, exactly. Fantastic. Michael, I know you've been working on that too. Thank you. I was going to say, I, so I, I have the, this is the fun part for me. I get to play with, I have not been able to play with Kubernetes a lot as of late. So I get to play with it now as I'm authoring this. But exactly to your point, the goal is to be able to extract that away. So that if you, you know, fill in that variable file and say, this is where I'm putting it. These are my credentials that I want to use, all that jazz. You're none the wiser. Everything will just run. So I have another question, but I want to make sure we're covering your topics here. So kind of to the earlier point, if a Linux team has automation and an application team has automation and a network team has automation, can they tie it all together? Does it have to just be the network team off doing their own thing, the Windows team for Jimmy stuff? Can they work together? And if say, how, how much together do they have to be? I was going to say, Greg, you already kind of alluded to this. I don't know if you want to talk about that with yeah, uh, sure. workflows and all that jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the um, one of the beauty parts is that um, you really can segregate, right? We have role-based access control, or RBAC is generally what we refer to it as. And it's really just a permission system inside, right? So generally what you're going to have is you're going to have your groups or your silos, right? You'll have your network team. Uh, you'll have your ops team, dev team, XYZ, insert whatever you want in there. And they will create automations. They'll have their own sets of credentials to log into those devices. They'll have their own Git repositories with their files. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to create automations in there, uh, what we call job templates. It's where you kind of bring it all together into these job templates. And they can perform all kinds of interesting tasks. Now, I have those. They're great. They're easy for uh, my organization to consume. We can share it amongst each other. Cool part is... We can share these job templates with other folks. So uh, the operations guys, whenever they want to uh, provision a machine, well, they want to provision it all the way through, but then they want to add the networking portion too, right? So I can share a job template that allows them to execute only. So I'll allow them to pass in some variables. Maybe um, this is the host. This is the interface it's on. This is the VLAN it should be on, right? They'll pass that to the, um, to the job template. And they'll be able to execute that. It'll perform that update. And that's it. They can't make any modifications to my stuff. They can't look at my playbooks if I don't want them to. They can't touch my credentials. So basically, I could put guardrails around any piece of automation I want to share with another group in there. And honestly, as Michael uh, said earlier, we can create these things called workflows. And it's really just a visual builder where you, I mean, you're playing Minecraft. You're snapping together little Lego bricks, right? You're just lining things up in there and they'll run and each little brick is just a new piece of automation it could be one i've created could be one somebody else created but they've given me execute permissions i can add it in there bob's your uncle it's you're you're basically done i love it <laughs> can i automate my bob's minecraft server <laughs> i always love that phrase <laughs> i watch a lot of british television it's infected my brain <laughs> <laughs> magic magical so I'm going to ask the question that, of course, we're going to get asked. Um, we know that a sender is open source. You can go get it, and we will put the link in the comments and all over the place, and it's on our website, CIQ.com. Um, Jimmy, you said that you're working on an installer. Is that like a CIQ engage with us thing, or is that something that also is going to be open source, or we have, have we not yet? It's, it'll be open source also. Okay, that is that's a huge benefit to the community and super exciting. So thank you so much for working on that. And obviously, we will all be super excited. Um, I imagine that for the networking people, something like Ledger would be important as well so that they can 
in my mind, Ledger is it's probably a lot of things, Jimmy, um, Greg, and Michael. But I imagine to me, it's like a way to see everything that has happened, right? To like run the reports and make sure that everything is good in the hood and have some like human eyes on it. Is that accurate? Yeah. So Ledger basically grew out of the original project I open sourced, and then I kind of brought it in house and started making a lot of changes to it. So what it is is a cinder itself has a lot of data, lots and lots of data. Literally every change has happened on every single system and every change that didn't happen, things we didn't have to change. But the idea was basically to pare down all that data that we have in a cinder to something that's usable that I can actually see what I want. Because searching within there is not the greatest thing at the current point, which is one of the, the points I plan on helping to work on on the open source side. But within here, basically, we can export all the data that's coming out of a cinder into a cinder ledger, and it basically ingests these logs, looks through it, it pulls out all the important data about all my machines. So every single host I have in there, I have all the facts and all the data within there for those machines, so I can start building my own reports off them. Makes it really easy to go and say, okay, I need to see the kernel version on every single one of my server is there. The data is there because it collected it automatically when it ran the playbooks. But also I have kind of a rolling change log of every change that's happened on my network as it's happened with all the data within there. So for instance, I find a server and I know somebody changed, say, the um, resolve.conf on one of my servers. I'm trying to figure out who actually did that. I can easily go in there and just type in resolve.conf and it's going to pull up all the different servers that that has changed on recently. I can narrow it down to just the one server I want. I click on there. It shows me all the data about what... Uh, playbook that ran in, what job that ran in, including a link back to a cinder with the actual job it ran in with. So it makes it really easy to kind of track down and see what's happening on there and changes as they occur versus just this huge log stream of everything. That was an excellent description. Thank you. And thanks for working on that. Super cool. So I think we have a question. Dun, dun, dun. Question from Art, I believe. Yes, Arthur Tide. What's up? Go. Thanks for watching. Can you comment on a sender and Terraform in the same context, such as cloud? So I'll say this, I've not only can I comment on it, I've done this in real life, uh, not in production, but done in real life. So I will say this, I'm a big fan of using the right tool for the right job. And I'm going to just speak for myself. And in my experience, the, one of the things that I like about Terraform is that it's stateful. So it's very good at instantiating infrastructure as code, a sender. And Ansible uh, can also do it very well. But if I had to choose a strength, I think configuring after the fact is where it's super strong. So I've done exactly that where I deploy everything I need to. And by the way, still using a sender to be a centralized orchestrator. So I don't want to take a sender out of the equation whatsoever. Uh, so we can still use Terraform modules in an Ansible playbook to call Terraform scripts, save the stateful file, even use Terraform Enterprise if you were so inclined. So if you put the state, if you want to put the state file in the cloud, different enterprise, you can still do that as well. But then after that, now that you have the infrastructure, you can take a sender to do configuration after the fact. And that's just an example of using something, you know, that's stateful to set up code or set up infrastructure and then using a sender afterwards. I'm actually doing that now, not so much with Terraform, uh, and I'm going to switch to that. But for example, I can use uh, EKS CTL, which is the package that allows me to spin up EKS clusters. So I went through all the pain and trouble of setting up policies and roles and everything to set up an EKS cluster to install a sender. Well, I don't want to do all this all over again. So I have an Ansible playbook that actually in, invokes EKS CTL to, and to set that up. Similar to Terraform in that I'm saving state so all the infrastructure is set up, but then I'm using a sender afterwards to do things like um, install a sender, set it up, do all that stuff. So the short answer part is we can absolutely do that. We have done it. Um, and also I'll expand that to if you have something else that you're using, and we have a lot of organizations that do that too, they might have something they're already using for automation. We're not interested in introducing pain to clients. We want to, If you want to use something to start with, just because it's been there and it would cause some pain to just rip it out, that's not the goal. Uh, and Terraform is something I've seen quite a bit in that context. So let me stop there. I, I don't know if Greg or Jimmy has any thoughts on that afterwards, but. No. Nope. Perfect. That's good. 
I do know that Greg has something he would like to show us, though. Yes. Yes. Sure. I do. Let me uh, get show my <laughs> screen share going. Did yes. do a card trick? Uh, of sorts. Huzzah. Card the trick is whether I can get the screen share to function I properly. The card trick to get screen sharing to work. Huzzah. There, there it is. <laughs> All right. So I have a... Um, a configuration as code kind of demo here. And so we talked earlier about what is config as code. I store the configuration, right? This is what I want it to look like. And I tell it to push, but I'm doing it uh, with a sender and I'm doing it against, let me hide that. I'm doing it against uh, Cisco kit, right? So it's actually known equipment that you are probably familiar with if you're listening to this. Not everybody's heard of Microtik, but everybody's heard of Cisco. If you look right here, I've got a whole bunch of job templates. Those are basically individual playbooks. You see, I have a bunch of them that are doing very discrete tasks. So that's what I try and do, right? The CAC stuff, it's very discrete tasks. As in, uh, traditionally, when I used to write playbooks, I would have them do a whole bunch of stuff, right? I'd configure all these different things in there. Now, when I write them, I write them to do little bite-sized pieces, right? So this is just configuring the access list, DNS settings, interface settings, NTP settings, because it starts making them those Lego bricks where I can take them and reuse them in different places. And in this example, I'm going to go ahead and fire this joker off right here. It is the uh, workflow. And as soon as I fire it off, it's going to run into the workflow visualizer. It lets me, uh, well, first, it's actually got a server that's prompting me where are the configs that we're going to be running this from, right? So tonight's uh, change is actually coming out of this repository and I can paste in whatever I want. All of my stuff's in public repos. So Feel free to get in there and take a look at what I'm doing, but I'm going to launch this job and it runs into the visualizer. So remember we talked about build things into workflows and have them break out and do interesting individual things. Well, this is it. Each one of these squares is a different playbook, right? It's a different job template that's going to do something. The very first thing I do is I do a backup, right? That's uh, something you should probably perform before you do your uh, networking as well as you can schedule just backups on kind of an even interval. But what I'm doing a little bit different in this one is I'm doing a backup to a Git repository, right? So again, this is a public Git repo. You probably don't want to do this with your production stuff, but it uh, backs up to a Git repository, but I'm doing a point in time snapshot. So what that does is it does a backup and it actually creates point in time tag. So here's my repo where it's backing up. If in GitHub, you've ever noticed this little tag section over here, if I click it, you see it just completed uh, creating one, right? 817, 1840, that's the time now. So it actually created that. Now, this is the date. You could actually have it be meaningful to whatever change you're actually performing right now. Um, but ultimately, it's so I can do a rollback in case things don't quite go right. Well, in my case, everything did go right, but is anybody who's really run big networks and done it over time, everything will go right. All of my testing will look good until my users show up at 8 a.m. And then my phone starts going crazy. It's blowing up whatever configuration I did to the core router, to whatever it happened to be, the firewall, things are broken. Uh, I think the last one I did where I screwed things up, it was an MTU adjustment that I put in there wrong. And you know everything's on fire. I need to roll back. Well, how do I do that, right? If it was normal change procedures, I'd have this rollback. I would go and I'd grab the config files and I'd do all these things while I'm scrambling and my brain is fried. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. But with point in time backups, I come in here and I look at the tag release I have. I will copy that tag release, go back into my Ascender interface here, and I happen to have a Nexus config rollback. I'm going to fire that off. It's going to ask me, what's the repo tag? I'll give it the repo tag we just created and I'll launch it. So now what it's going to do, instead of using my, here's my change control window, uh, Git repository, it's actually going to reach out to my backup repo. It's going to grab that specific tag, right? That point in time before I broke everything. It's going to pull those files and it's using the exact same playbooks. Again, I don't have to modify these playbooks. I don't have to change them in any way. It's using those same playbooks to actually do my rollback. Right. And you can tell this configuration looks almost identical. It's just not doing a backup before it does this. Right. So whatever the effective devices are, I just run it against those effective devices. Say, use this point in time and I've instantly rolled back and I've undone all of my changes. Now, you can see I made those changes 
Oh, I would say with the backup included, it took about 50 seconds. Now I just did the rollback, it took about 20. So now my users should be back online. It's performing post-provisioning testing, making sure everything's good. And we're, we're done, we're clean. We're back out like it never happened. And then I get all these calls like, oh, you fixed it, great, great, great. And uh, I'll secretly just myself, I'll just say, oh yeah, I just undid everything I did to break it the first time around. So, so to what me, you're saying this, is you break things on purpose to look good. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's this old saying, like uh, if everything's broken, they look at you and say, what do we even need you for? You know, nothing's working. But when you're doing your job and everything's working, they're like, what do we even need you for? Nothing's ever broken. So uh, sometimes you got to remind them why you're there, I think is, is ultimately <laughs> what it is. But I love this because it does so many things. It does my backups, right? I actually have backups with, if they're in a Git repository, I see revision history. I can see what changed, right? What flipped at what time. I got my point in time snapshot so I can actually do rollbacks or, you know, five months from now, I can see um, if I have a lab environment, I can just pull that, shove it into that lab environment, build that back up and see what I was doing there. There's just a lot of possibilities in there. It's also good for compliance. Uh, anybody who has any controls they have to test against. It's a really convenient way of doing it. And honestly, it's something at the time of like when I first got into automation, I even know this sort of thing was possible. Like I didn't even know you could really do things like this. So it was kind of a game changer for me. That's very cool. Thank you for showing that, Greg. For yeah. sure. Michael, do you want to add something? No, I think that was it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Well, I will say this. We've been talking about um, hardware network devices, but what I, one thing that I will say as well is I don't want to limit this to just hardware. If you're talking about whether you want to manage just cloud elements in general. So if you want to deal with like AWS load balancers, VPCs, everything within there, you can. Uh, or if you're, let's say you're a Cisco customer and you want to use uh, virtual Cisco routers and whatever cloud you choose, we can do that as well with Ansel Playbooks and Ascender. Uh, I don't want to limit this conversation to just hardware networking because that's not the case. We can do whatever we want, wherever we want. And I'll say for myself too, maybe if I'm testing something, I, you know, I'm a big uh, just testing in the cloud person. So I might choose a, a few Cisco CSR 1000Ds and throw those up in AWS. Maybe that's my test environment. And by the way, I can use either uh, Ansible or Ascender to spin that stuff up, do whatever I need to, do my testing, operational testing, like Ray was talking about, and then either roll things back, tear things down. Um, honestly, whatever you want to do, you can. So, But I just want to throw that wrinkle in there too, not just hardware networking. Another question for you guys. I know back when I was having to do with networking, and I'm not a network guy, so it was always fun for me to not have to do that. But we always had to deal with tools like IDS, IPS, so the all the security tools that sat on the network as well. And they always seem to fall into a network realm. Is that something else you can do with a sender? So not only just traditional network devices, but also the security appliances that get thrown in the mix. I was going to say, do we, I don't know what we want to do. I'll do, we'll do the regular thing. I'll go and then Greg will clean it up. Uh, to answer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I'll say this too, going back to the conversation that, that we were having, in, in my experience, those might be two separate teams. So you might have a campus networking team that's in charge of routing and switching. You might have a different team that's more security focused. So they might be dealing with more everything that protects the organization inside and outside. Um, firewalls being among them, um, logging aggregators like a Splunk or anything else like that. So absolutely, you can do it. They might have, let's say for example, if they wanna have their own sets of Git repositories that they author and manage, Maybe the networking team can't touch the security team's repositories and vice versa because they have different kinds of expertise. You can honestly keep those things separate if you want, and they can have their own job templates and do all that stuff. But the word I use usually in this case is holistically. Typically, if you're deploying an app, it's holistic. So the networking team and the security team are usually involved, whether that's uh, punching holes into firewalls, uh, could be a number of other things from a security perspective. Then you can use things like workflows so that when the time comes to put that stuff together, you can. Um, so just speaking from a high-level perspective, absolutely. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff with Palo Alto in, in the past for myself. Um, Jimmy obviously does things 
in the lab for his devices. I don't know, Jim, if those are microtick as well or something else. Are those are those microtick devices? I can't. I don't yeah. know. If, this is the thing. It's Ansible, so I don't have to know. But long and short of it is, uh, short answer is yes. I would say yeah. the short answer is if there's a way to connect into the device, whether it's an API, whether it's SSH, whether it's even just Telnet, you can generally find a way to automate it. Yeah, talking about For, security and Telnet at the same time. That's awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, you guys are it, loving that right now. Good problem. <laughs> well, you're talking about um, kind of an IDS, like intrusion detection. Like it, a lot of times when we see security teams use this, they're using it as glue. Like they're using a sender to be the glue between things, right? So your IDS picks up something anomalous. Well, it can actually call the sender API, which will then connect into your firewall, um, increase the logging level for maybe the specific IP subnet that, that's getting hammered or it sees anomalous, right? That'll increase the logging. You'll actually be able to, uh, you know, what do you call that? Enrichment? I think they usually call that investigation enrichment inside of the security world. So that's going to be able to give you a whole lot more information that you're going to be able to come through. As soon as you are complete, you've closed out that ticket. You can have the automation then push, lower the logging back down, right? But keep in mind that you don't always have to be the one pushing the button or touching the things. If you have systems that can detect something and can make a call out, they're going to be able to take advantage of automation, right? To connect all these interesting pieces together in very interesting ways. Yeah. I think Jimmy, you and I talked to a customer who was doing this. They would detect an attempt. They would put it into a file and every five minutes they would push the blacklist out to 6,000 firewalls globally. Yeah. So nobody had to touch it. Just did it on its own. It's very cool. We are getting close to time, guys. Is there any topic we didn't talk about? I know we kind of talked about a lot of different stuff, but any anything that we didn't talk about that we should have? Well, I, I heard... Think, or... Go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I heard Jimmy say that, you know, that um, people are understaffed and underpaid. And I was thinking, well, if Zane, you wanted to pay us more, you know, we could discuss that right now. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to say it. I was like, I think that was a shot. <laughs> wow. I was waiting. Wow. I was actually just dropping a hint. I mean, Live on air. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting team call tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> have to come prepared. <laughs> Jimmy, anything else you want to add? No, just watch out for buses. D definitely. <laughs> buses out. do run on the schedule. so. Yes. The jaywalker, the jaywalker. So if somebody did want um, our help, so from CIQ, where they're like, okay, this is interesting. I want to talk more about it. Um, obviously, you guys reach out to us, right? Go to our website, CIQ.com. There is a million ways, literally on every single page. <laughs> you could go in there and put in your information and an email will get sent usually to me. So I am more than happy to reach out and we can schedule a call and I'll grab one of these guys to come chat about your environment and what's going on. Um, but we are we are here, right? Like you can go play with a sender right now. You can go and grab it. Jimmy's working on... Um, you know, some other, other things so that it's, you know, easy install and that will be out soon. Uh, there's links all over the place. We, we want, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what it is that you guys are doing, the questions that you have, um, and, and chat with you about that. So definitely come and see us. Very exciting. And if they want help kind of implementing and setting it up, like we do that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah we'll send Zane out. I'll come hang out. Like I said, I made it easy. All he has to do it's is a script. Right exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so easy, Zane can do it. The goal. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Well, um, we will be back here, same time, same place. Every week we are live. We are so excited for your guys' questions and your interest. Reach out to us at CIQ.com and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Thanks, guys. And thanks for all of your work. It's amazing. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody.